everyone and welcome back to Neuropsychology. So today we are going to talk about the occipital lobes and as you guys know by now the occipital lobes are very important for visual processing. So information that comes into the eyes will be processed largely in our occipital lobes. So our brain is organized around vision. So for example our perceptions are mainly visual, our movements are guided by visual information, our social behavior is visual, our entertainment is visual, and even our nights are enriched by visual dreams. So in this chapter we're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the occipital lobe and then about the different pathways. Um, and lastly we'll talk about disorders of the visual pathways and visual system. So as you guys all know, the occipital lobe is all the way to the back of the brain. So on the lateral side of the brain, there are no clear boundaries that separate the occipital cortex from the temporal and parietal cortex. And this is because the occipital tissue kind of merges in with these other regions. And this is why there's a lot of confusion about the exact boundaries on the lateral side. However, on each hemisphere's medial surface, the occipital lobe is distinguished uh, from the parietal lobe by this little sulcus right here called the parietal occipital sulcus, which makes sense, right? So parietal, which stands for parietal cortex, occipital, occipital cortex. So the parietal occipital sulcus is the boundary between the two cortices. On the medial side of the occipital cortex, there's also this really clear landmark called the calcerine sulcus, which you can see right here. So this sulcus contains much of our primary visual cortex, or also V1. So whenever I talk about visual cortices, I will refer to V1, or V2, or V3, etc. Where V1 is the primary visual cortex, V2 is the secondary um, visual cortex, etc. But we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail in a later slide. So what's cool about this calcerine um, sulcus is that it divides the upper and the lower halves of the visual world. So if you remember from previous videos, we talked about um, the visual system. So information from our upper visual field will be processed on the lower side of the calcerine sulcus. So let's say uh, this is your brain, your eyes will be here. If you're looking at a tree right here, the top of the tree will be processed at the bottom of the brain. So it will be processed um, underneath the calcerine sulcus. And then on the ventral side of the brain, which you can see right here is the bottom of the brain, you also have these two gyri that reach all the way to the back of the occipital lobe. And these are the lingual gyrus right here, which you can see right here, and the fusiform gyra, gyrus or gyri, which you can see right here. So the, ling uh, the lingual gyrus includes part of the visual cortical regions um, V2 and also a little subpart of V3, which we call VP. And the fusiform area contains part of V4 regions. And V4 is really important for color processing. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. Okay, so many years ago, Rodman first divided the monkey cortex into three main visual re regions. But later, after we got, got more sophisticated imaging machines and anatomical techniques, finer subdivisions were found. So even though a lot of research is uh, being done in the occipital cortex or the occipital lobes, this map is still not complete. So here in... Oh, get my mouse. So here in image A, you can see the lateral surface of a monkey brain and its little subdivision. So here you can see V1. In the pink you can see v, uh, V2, um, blue V3, etc. So V1 is all the way, is always all the way in the back of your brain and the more forward you go, the higher the visual cortex number will be. So just note that the parietal and temporal cortex also help with visual processing. So you can also find visual areas in the parietal and the temporal cortices. 
And then in figure B, you can see the visual area mapped on a two-dimensional flat map. So technically, it's the same thing as picture A, but um, it's technically just a pancake or a flat pancake that contains both the lateral and the medial areas. So it's technically just a cortex all cut out and put flat on the countertop. So this is really useful to see how everything is connected and how everything uh, lies next to one another. Okay, so the human version of these subdivisions is still not 100% clear and people are still doing research on it. But Dr. Kravitz and his colleagues, they created this beautiful reconstruction of both monkey and human brains. So as you can see, so on the left you see the monkey reconstruction. So this is the back of the brain. This is the same thing as we just saw. So it's just technically the outer layer of our cortex um, cut off the brain and laid down like a flat pancake. And here you see the monkey um, visual cortex or occipital cortex. And here you see the human occipital cortex. And as you can see, V1 is all the way to the back of the brain. Then you have V2, V3. Here is also a little bit V3, V4, etc. So it's the same in humans, V1, 2, 3, 4. And then it gets a little bit more complicated the more inward we go. However, it is actually very difficult to compare monkey and human brains. So monkey brain maps are based on anatomy and connectivity analyses. So often these brains are extracted from the monkeys and um, the cortex is literally just examined. And with humans, we're not allowed to do that. So the human maps are now heavily based on non-invasive techniques such as uh, fMRI, which we talked about in a previous chapter. So therefore, it's really hard to compare these different techniques. Nevertheless, there is a very strong correspondence between monkey and humans, um, especially in the early visual areas. So V1 and V2 and V3, it looks pretty similar, right? So V1, V2, V3 and kind of V4 are very similar. And the additional regions beyond V4 in the human brain may suggest that we have more visual processing capacity than monkeys do. Okay, although the primary visual area V1 appears anatomic, uh, anatomically homogeneous, so if you just um, cut out a piece of cortex of V1, it looks like all these cells are very similar. However, that is actually not the case if you stain it. So the primary visual cortex, or V1, has actually very distinct laminar or layered organization. Normally, the cortex consists of six cortical layers, as you guys learned a, way, uh, a while back. But in the visual cortex, you can sometimes see more than six layers. And this is in part due because the fourth cortical layer in the occipital lobe, or in V1, it kind of um, has sublayers. So the fourth layer actually has four distinct sublayers, and they're very densely packed together. So these appear as a thick stripe. And because of this, the primary visual cortex got the nickname stride cortex, because if you look right here, here you see a cell body stain where the cell bodies of the neurons are stained. You can see this laminar organization, but you can, even, you can see it even better when there's a myelin stain. And do you remember what a myelin stain was? Did it stain the axons or the dendrites or the cell bodies? So in case you forgot, it would stain the axons because the myelin would be around the axons. So here you see a lot of axons and here you see a lot of axons. So just because of these different colors, um, these are called uh, laminae or, or stripes. And this is the reason why V1, so the primary visual cortex, is also called the striate cortex. Okay, so here's another picture of a monkey brain. And on the right, it's very schematic, it's just a cartoon. Monkey brain, brainstem, cerebellum. So if you would cut out a tiny little slice of the occipital lobe, 
um, and make a flat pancake out of it again. You have V1 all the way to the back of the brain in pink purpley color here. And then in front of that, in orange and green, you have V2. So for now, for this slide, let's just focus on um, the pink purpley color, so V1. Okay, so um, if you stain V1 with cytochrome oxidase, you could see subregions of V1 too. So cytochrome oxidase is basically an enzyme that is crucial for making energy available in cells. So area within the primary visual cortex that are rich in cytochrome, these are called blobs. And the regions around these blobs um, that don't have a lot of cytochrome activity are called interblobs. So I actually love these names. I find them so funny and I'm sure you will not, you will not forget these. So here in the picture, you see these um, cytochrome rich areas, little blobs, and then the colors in between, or sorry, the cells in between are called interblobs. So all the cells in the blobs or blob cells, they are very important for color perception. And cells in the interblobs or also called interblob cells, they have a very important role um, in form and motion perception. Okay, so moving on to V2. So the area adjacent to the primary visual area of V1 is called, you guessed it, V2, or a secondary visual area. So this um, area technically has a very similar structure as V1. When you stain V2 with cytochrome oxidase, you won't see blobs and interblobs, but you actually see stripes. So you have three types of stripes. You have thin stripes, which you can see right here, thin stripes, thick stripes, and pale stripes. So thin stripes are very important for color perception. Thick stripes are very important for form perception. And pale stripes are very important for motion perception. So if you remember from the previous slide, okay, so remember color, form, and motion. Oh, if you go to the previous slide, blob cells um, are important for color perception and interblobs are important for form and motion perception. So whenever, and this was in V1, so whenever V1, whenever these regions send their information to V2, the blob cells will talk to the thin stripes, which are important also for color perception, and the interblobs will talk to both the thick stripes for form perception and pill stripes for, mo uh, for motion perception. So if we go back, interblobs do form and motion, then they split it up when it goes to V2, where thick stripes do form perception, pill stripes are important for motion perception. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about color perception. So even though relative amount of color processing, um, it kind of varies across the occipital regions. Um, there is one region though, in the visual cortex, that as its main job um, is color processing. And this area is called V4. So color related information does more than simply allow us to tell the difference between uh, let's say, for example, blue and yellow. Color also enriches our capacity to detect motion and depth and also position. So, for example, uh, for example, um, doggos and kitties, as you can see to the right bottom, such a cute photo. So doggos and kitties cannot analyze colors the way we do. And they are essentially, um, they kind of see a black and white world but that's not the only thing. They also have reduced visual capacities in general compared to us humans. So the color system within primates is technically optimized to differentiate uh, between, for example, edible fruits like um, an apple or a banana um, compared to the background. So for example, the green leaves. So color vision provides important information for object recognition. So what I definitely want you to take back from this is that 
color perception is not just important for differentiating this color from that color, but it also has to do with movement, depth, and position. Okay, and that was the end of this video. I will see you guys back soon for the next one.